So I'm Josh Zimmerman, uh, that's my Twitter handle up there. Uh, I do operations side of things for the UW libraries. I do a handful of other things whenever they need me to be doing them. Uh, before you ask, yes, I, I'm a stereotypical Wisconsinite. Uh, I've been using Puppet since 2011-ish, and uh, just in terms of the topic of specifically learning, relearning, uh, I did teach Hebrew for about eight years, and I've tutored people along the way. Is, so I, I've got a little bit of experience in actually uh, teaching people and writing curriculum, that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I have this issue where I kind of ramble and the things that are on the slides might not really connect with what you think the talk might be or what I'm giving at the time. So uh, to just kind of go through like the general hmm, flow of this talk, uh, so we're gonna start by talking a little bit about relearning, and when I say relearning, I mean actually starting from scratch, learning something that you already know, just like how if you hadn't ri ridden a bike in several years, you'd be relearning how to ride a bike, even though you just kind of get on and go, um, and why that's a good thing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to go about relearning something or how to teach other people how to relearn something, and we're gonna talk then a little bit specific, more specifically about uh, dealing with Puppet with this. So the first two thirds of the talk or so are gonna be a little bit more general than Puppet specific. So, and I've already lied to you because the first part is really giving you some context to tell you why relearning something might be useful to you. Um, part of why taking the time to relearn Puppet in any organization um, and why it's been effective for me is the context in which my organization found myself or found ourselves. Uh, so as much as I'd love for you to be able to pick up everything I'm going to say here wholesale and just plop it into your org, uh, it might not work. So me justifying this needs to give you context so that you might know whether or not this is useful to you or whether you can use parts of what I'm talking about. Um, so gather around adults, it's story time. Uh, this, and as this is story time, and I'm gonna be describing uh, some of my organization's shortcomings for the last few years, uh, it's important to me to remind all of you that there are a lot of organizations out there that struggle with these kinds of things, uh, even if yours don't. And it's important that we have empathy for people that are struggling, especially when it comes to updating something like Puppet 3 to 4. It's, it's good to remember that there are still people updating from Puppet 2 to Puppet 3 or Puppet 4. Um, and, you know, as you are here at PuppetConf, it means that you're either ahead of the curve or you're trying to be ahead of the curve, and that puts you in a better spot than most people out there. So as we talk about these things, remember to have empathy because that's really important. Um, and all that being said, some of what I am about to say might be a little bit scary, so we're gonna switch to a better backdrop. <laughs> um, much better. Uh, so our story begins long ago in the uh, far off year of uh, 2011. You might remember it, uh, the Arab Spring was happening. Uh, Wisconsin had just passed Act 10, which had taken away the collective bargaining rights of state employees, and I'm not bitter about that, you can tell, right? Um, anyhow, more importantly to our story is that our hero, which is of course me, uh, had just been hired as a uh, full-time, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, jack-of-all-trades sysadmin off of a previous uh, limited term employment stint. Um, I was doing primarily Windows work for them, and eventually I got asked if I would help out with this fledgling Linux infrastructure. Uh, our Linux infrastructure, uh, which was using Puppet, had begun by uh, our developers, actually, who had been frustrated with the then current Solaris environment that we had. Uh, that environment had been run by uh, people contracted out of central IT, um, and those admins, by and large, did not have the time, energy, or desire to learn and administrate something that had not been designed with them or not you know, included them in the design process whatsoever. Um, and so more person hours were needed for dealing with this new fledgling infrastructure, and so I started getting involved. Um, and everything was very prototypey at this point. Um, and as we all know, uh, Prototypes don't stay prototypes and they become production. Um, and we were about to roll out this new flagship search application uh, and one of the Ruby gems stopped working in Solaris because it had been updated and we needed the new feature. Um, so that pushed our Linux production into full on, or, or Linux environment into full on production. 
Um, and you know, we've all been in this situation. Uh, we rolled with it for the most part, and we were running on good old Puppet 2.6 or whatever was in EPEL at the time, and mcollect of one point something. Um, and the people before me had made some interesting architecture points, and they'd started causing some really pain point, really big pain points. Our developers were actually big fans of the benefits of Solaris, and they operated in a world where they didn't know how many VMs they were gonna get and whether or not they'd have to shove everything onto it. So they tried to do this thing where they uh, tried to recreate some of the features of Solaris zones in RHEL, which was a terrible idea. Um, just kind of imagine, uh, you know, something similar to truth jails with libraries installed under them, but without any of the good benefits of having an actual truth jail. Um, so, uh, Puppet deployed a skeleton of all of this. M Collective, with, with some custom plugins, was used to dump all of our software into it. Um, and it was really difficult to understand all of it. it was a lot of moving pieces, and it worked for us for a time. Um, before we get into how our code base developed, it's important to note that there were no tests. Uh, some of the frameworks that were used for Puppet were either new or our developers didn't know about them. Uh, version control was done in Subversion, but no thought had been put into how we used it, so I'd often find that somebody had gone to our Puppet Master, manually edited code, and not committed anything, so I had to fix all of that for them because they just borked our entire install, um, which was a lot of fun for a new junior admin. And you know, luckily, a couple of us were really interested in making things better. We moved it to Git, which was far easier for most of our, us to work in. Uh, we moved over to Puppet Enterprise, which supported newer versions for RHEL and easy deploys of those versions. Uh, we refactored a bunch of code at that point. Uh, you know, things were put into proper classes, which they hadn't been before. Uh, and we started using some modules from the Forge, but because of our architecture, only some system level uh, modules really worked for us. Uh, and we replaced the custom M Collective plugins with a somewhat automated uh, packaging system, which was still a mess, but it was a much better mess than what we had. Um, so we went through an upgrade to Puppet 3, and that was pa pretty painless because we weren't really doing much, any, much of anything complex at that point in the language itself. Um, and unfortunately, when you have a very small team of admins and people working on your infrastructure, uh, and everything kind of just works, uh, you know, you end up with things getting prioritized over that work. Um, in our case, we had a huge factor in uh, needing to migrate to a new integrated library system, uh, which it, it, if you wanna hear some tech war stories, come find me after, like I literally have the worst war stories from this move, from this migration. Um, but between this migration and making sure we were keeping up with incoming support requests, uh, our architecture just kind of stagnated and sat unimproved and unchanged till earlier this year. Um, and, and enough pain points had been clear enough that people were calling for both the overhaul or throwing out of Puppet and our current, or in our now former infrastructure. Um, and those voices were strong enough that we finally needed to move on it. Um, so, we were still constrained by a lack of a good dev environment. We couldn't stop managing our current architecture, as I'm sure you all know, um, until we had migrated off of it. And migrating with our current code would make that process far more painful and far more complex for us. So we were painfully aware that none of us had also kept up well enough with how Puppet had changed over the last two years while we were dealing with that migration to the new library system, uh, which left us asking, you know, how the heck we were gonna deal with this thing. So, uh, me being the person who likes learning, I was just like, man, let's relearn everything. Uh, this was our answer. Uh, and you know what makes a good dev environment? A new system that has nothing to do with your old system. And you know what makes a good production environment is, again, something that had nothing to do with our tire fire. So, <laughs> Updating and changing our processes became easier because we didn't have to worry about what we had done before. We literally decided we were going to scrap everything and start from scratch. Um, and this is why I said that I needed to kind of start with some context. We have a couple things going for us and that we have a very small team, so we don't have you know 200 people committing to our puppet repos. Uh, we have, you know, a smaller code base than a lot of people, which means that 
you know, we can let something burn and kind of barely manage it while working on our new architecture. And that's not everybody's case. So some of these things might work for you, some of them might not. Um, so yeah, we got rid of our tire fire of an architecture. Um, and yeah. I also want to point out that in the world at large in tech, or even outside of tech, we, we're often faced with this need to use a skill or knowledge that we haven't used in a few years, uh, which is especially true in tech where you have languages that get out of date or tools that get out of date like we had with Puppet, um, or you move to a new job that doesn't use Puppet and you come back to a different job after that that's using Puppet and you're stuck with, well, I knew this tool two, three years ago, but what do I do now? I'm not up to date with it. Um, so th there are a lot of cases where I f feel that it's good to advocate for actually starting over and relearning something because things do change. Um, and I'm not trying to advocate here that it's not okay to upgrade a tool or language in place. Uh, that's a definite good way to do things if that's right for your context. Um, my argument for this talk is essentially that you should consider whether relearning a tool or, or language is right for you at that time, or for your team, or for specific people on your team. Um, you know, it, it's important to note that our communities don't always move in the way that they're documented. So even if you're reading documents, you might, on what changed in between versions, you might not really be coming up to the fact that, uh, you know, something critical has changed. Uh, like if we were to have relied solely on change logs and release notes um, and documents describing on how to upgrade from Puppet 2 to 3 and 3 to 4, uh, we would have missed a lot. Um, the last time our code was overhauled was right around when Craig Dunn's first blog post on roles and profiles came out. We would not have found or learned any of that stuff because I had looked at it when we did that and kind of summarily forgot it because we used some of those ideas and moved on. So. It was definitely before Puppet Enterprise even had any of the, anything referring to roles and profiles within their documents or before Puppet professionals were you know, advocating for that when they were contracted out. Um, so, and I could spend an entire talk just talking about things that we would have missed in the last couple of years had we not done it, or had we not actually thoroughly tried to relearn what we needed to know. Um, and we as tech people, often advocate for complicating things because they're not good enough. Um, and relearning doesn't just help you with finding anti-patterns in your code base and fixing things, but it also can help you reinforce what good things you did do. You know, you might be reading a blog post or a document, you know, a year later saying, yeah, you should do this. And you're like, hey, we did this a year ago. We found it out on our own. And that reinforces the fact that that is something that you should keep doing. So it's not just about getting rid of the things that aren't, aren't working, but you should take time to reinforce good behaviors on your team and in your code as well with this. Um, and it's also important to note, like a lot of people are in the case that my team was where no, none of us were actually taught how to use Puppet. Somebody at some point pointed at us towards the Puppet documents and said, here's this tool we're using, go. Um, which means, no, again, no formal training. We had no set of do documents or blogs for like, hey, if you're new to this, look at these first. Uh, and this process has given us a little bit of an ability to step back and start writing some of those documents, start linking to some of these things in our, in our documentation to say, hey, if you're new to this tool, this is what you do. Um, and my final kind of justification for why relearning is a good process is that you're all entitled to your own opinions on open source, but as an industry, we're all moving to using more open source tools and software. And it's really important to note that when we deviate from more current versions, that we make things and especially from what the majority of the community is doing, we make it very, very difficult for the people that are supporting these tools, that are supporting our organizations because of that. Uh, we stifle the rate of change for other people. Uh, we request features that are unnecessary or unusable by most people. Uh, we, <laughs> you know, it, it, if you ever talk to open source maintainers, this is a huge pain point for them. So, and we can and should be providing feedback 
to maintainers on how their tools are used and how easy it is to upgrade to new versions. But it's important that we spend this time doing, giving that feedback, being very considerate and very deliberate about the feedback we're giving. So if you're still on Puppet 2 at this point, and it's probably not Puppet the company or pu the maintainers of pu the Puppet code that are at fault for you not being able to move on. It's probably part of your organization. So it's important that this needs to be part of our justification for why we do a renormalization process, why we relearn, because it's not just about us, we're part of a community here. Oops, skip the slide. So how are we supposed to relearn a tool or language? Are, you know, how are you supposed to relearn Puppet? I'm sitting up here, I've spent at least 10, 15 minutes talking about relearning and just justifying it, but I haven't told you anything about how to do this. So let's, again, break some things up a little bit. I'm gonna give you some general advice. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about advice for self-guided learning if you're on your own. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about guiding others and being guided by others in this process. Uh, one of the best things that we were able to do is get some buy-in from up top. Uh, if you have buy-in from managers, they can help facilitate this entire process. They can make sure that you have dedicated time at work to learn. They can help get resources like books or training. Uh, they can help run interference with other teams. If you are in a siloed environment, you might need that. Um, they can help those teams prioritize what's most important and they can figure out what needs to actually happen immediately for you. Uh, so managers are there to make your life early, and if you're going to do something time-consuming, like a relearning process for your team, get them involved. Um, context switching is really, really difficult. Uh, it can destroy your ability to learn something, even in a normal case. But in this, we're, it's gonna be doubly true because you're gonna be switching between maintaining your old Puppet code and trying to write new Puppet code and learn how to use Puppet now. And if you're switching like four hours a day learning new stuff and four hours a day maintaining your old stuff, you're not going to do well at remembering the things that you learned because, and you're not going to do well at separating the two versions. So that may mean that your organization has to have a talk about what you still support. Do you do bug fixes? Do you do like large refactors in the old code base? How long is your process gonna take? And you need to have these kinds of discussions with people as you embark on a process of relearning. And one of the mistakes that we made here was that we kind of split apart our team. We said, these people are going to go relearn Puppet, they're going to start doing cool things for us. And we said, these other people, they're gonna kind of sit behind and make sure that incoming support requests get de dealt with. Um, it means that those people are no longer able to help you with your decisions, either because they're not up to date or because uh, they just don't have any knowledge on the subject. Um, you, you're also essentially doing bimodal IT at that point, and I, everybody knows how that's not a really good thing. <laughs> um, so, and again, if those previous two pieces of advice are in play, if you've got your manager's support, if you are talking about what you do, you can start thinking about other ways to structure how you spend your time. Uh, Alice Goldfuss gave a really great talk at VelocityConf in June um, about how you can split up team time. You can have a rotation in which, say, one person or a couple of people on the team spend one week as janitors cleaning up the old mess and the other parts of the team are trying to blaze trails and actually get stuff up to shape. Um, so, um, and also don't start by assuming you don't need to relearn the basics. Uh, don't convince yourself that just because you know something already that you don't need to read an article or like an intro blog post. Um, you need to buy into the fact that you are trying to relearn something completely. Um, and Puppet has done a lot to make this really easy for you. There's a lot of uh, good documentation out there. There is the uh, self-guided courses, there are the learning VMs. You can pay them money to come and teach you as if you didn't know anything already. And I'm not trying to say this to make them money, I don't work for them, but they're there to support us using their tools, so use them if you need to. Um, and unfortunately, you might not have money to spend on an official training. Uh, you might not have anybody with a curriculum that is trying to say, get these things out of this. Uh, and this is a pretty common position to be in. It's the, team, or the position my team's always in for almost any given tool because we're a public library. Um, so, and you know how you learn best. Um, so 
I do have a little bit of general advice for how to frame your own learning when you're going through this process of you know, going through the learning VMs, reading documents, and trying to learn Puppet 4 as if you didn't know Puppet before. And the only real piece of advice I have is you know, eliminate your bias from this process. Um, the problem is that we all have cognitive biases that affect how we think about things. And if you don't know that they exist, if you don't know what they are, it's impossible for you to avoid them. Um, so the, the Wikipedia definition is that a cognitive bias refers to a systematic pattern of deviation from the norm or rationality and judgment, uh, whereby inferences about other people and situations may be drawn in an illogical fashion, which to sum up is essentially that our brains are great at pattern matching, uh, but sometimes we optimize and match patterns in a way that uh, looks, overlooks something. Um, a very good example of us doing this would be a fundamental attribution error, which is, you know, if you're driving your car and somebody cuts you off, your first reaction is to yell expletives at them. Uh, but you know, if you think about it for 15 seconds, that you know they could be trying to drive somebody to a hospital. They could. There's any number of reasons that they could have for legitimately cutting you off and possibly causing an accident. Um, but you don't have that information, and your first reaction is not to say well, I hope that person's okay, your first reaction is like, that person's terrible. Um, it's also important to know that there's a lot of research out there online um, and in journals, uh, and some of it's very difficult to parse. Some uh, cognitive biases are really related, um, but are named different things. So it, it, you, you read three journal articles and you're like, well, they're talking about the same thing, but they're slightly different. Um, so I'm gonna give you a couple examples that I find are really effective when you're uh, trying to learn that really stymie the learning process. Now, the first is confirmation bias. Uh, this is your tendency to find and favor information that supports your pre-existing knowledge, uh, and which is obviously one of the most uh, terrible biases for relearning something. Um, like, because this will affect even the way that your search, you put search terms into your browser. You know, this is one of the reasons that I was recommending going to official documentation for relearning. Uh, if you start from a place that you know has good information, you're going to at least help combat this bias. If you start from, I want to do this in Google, you're going to find something that tells you how to do this because that's what you were looking for, not because that's what the right thing to do is. Um, another good way to counteract this bias is actually finding multiple sources. So a couple of years ago, roles and profiles were in good use, but Puppet's documentation didn't have them. But you could still find multiple blog posts talking about why it was good, and that can help corroborate it. And we also have a really great community. You can hop into the Puppet community Slack and say, hey, I found this blog post saying that this is a good thing to do, is it? And you'll find a good conversation, probably one people, person will say no, and three people will say yes, and you're like, okay, Quorum, this is something to do. Um, and these two kind of sound like a bad high school band, which is great. Um, uh, they're relatively related. Uh, not invented here syndrome is actually something that happens on an organizational level. Uh, it's your organization's tendency to devalue and avoid things created outside of your organization. Uh, while the IKEA effect is your tendency to value more things that you had a hand in creating, like a crummy IKEA futon, right? You like that thing even though it's objectively terrible. Um, and it can be really difficult when, we're, when you're relearning to break from the things that you've made previously, um, as, you know, especially when you're trading it in for, some, that, for something that's written by the amorphous community. Um, but it also happens to be the case that a lot of people who I've talked to that have Puppet, especially old implementations of Puppet, that you have custom modules, classes, and resource definitions that were that are freely available in the Forge that were probably written by somebody who like works with that software more than you do. Um, <laughs> so, and it's important when you're trying to make decisions over whether you use a tool or a class that now exists elsewhere and you're trying to figure out whether your organization should continue with yours or move to a different one, uh, that to remind yourselves that the process here is partly normalization. You're trying to bring yourself back to where the community is. So even if you did something that you thought was really innovative and cool and worked really well for you, the point here is that you are now out of date and you need to bring yourself back in line. And if you need to re-innovate that afterwards, that's okay, but start by trying to 
bring yourself back in and eliminating yourself of your current status quo because your current status quo is painful. Uh, negativity bias is another one that's really important here because uh, negativity bias is your brain's uh, tendency to remember things and put stronger emphasis on things that were negative to you, whether that's physical pain or mental pain or anything on that order. Um, so when we do a relearning process, anything that you did before one time that didn't work, you're gonna be like, well, that didn't work before. Why should I try this again? But it didn't work before for you two years ago. It didn't work before for you like, you know, when you were on a different version of Puppet. And if this is what the community is saying, try it. You know, and again, you might find it doesn't work, but you need to give it a full go. You need to actually work towards that. All right, so, you know, maybe you weren't able to keep your team together, or maybe you are in a case where you're trying to onboard a new employee who needs to relearn Puppet. Um, maybe you just are really great and you've learned all this far quicker than your team and you need to help them come up to what Puppet is now. Um, so what can you do in these situations? Uh, how do you go about teaching somebody? Um, this is, I think, the most important thing, uh, if you can't tell that I think that. Um, if you know current practices and the rest of your team doesn't, and you come to them saying, we need to fix these things, what you're really telling them is that all of the things that you're doing is wrong. And so you need to have empathy for the fact that they're not doing anything wrong. They have working infrastructure. They're doing their jobs the way that they believe is adequate and accurate. Um, and if you're coming at them from, a, from you trying to force change, you're going to get no traction and they're going to kind of reject everything you're doing uh, because you don't have the empathy. So you need to get their buy-in. You need to talk to them about their pain points and talk to them about this process helping to solve some of those pain points. Um, this is one of the things that's really helpful about getting some, a company like Puppet or a consultancy to come in and help you. Um, when you're learning on your own or when you're learning as a team, you can sometimes forget that you need to have goals, that you need to have structure. Uh, that curriculum, or, or that, a curricu that a curriculum is there in a class because you're trying to meet specific goals of knowledge. That's why teachers give you syllabi at the beginning of a semester. It's because they want to say, by this week you'll have learned this, by this week you'll have learned this. It's not about the homework, it's about what you'll learn. Um, and so if you are helping other people learn, you need to provide that structure for them. If you are learning from somebody who's not giving you structure, you need to be able to constructively tell them what kind of structure you do need. Um, and that means that you're probably going to, at least for Puppet, tie this to actual projects. You know, you don't go in saying, hey, we're gonna add testing and we're gonna spend three weeks learning how to test and not actually add any tests to your code. That doesn't really work. You spend three weeks learning and you're like, well, do we use this? Um, and underestimating the time that it's gonna take to roll something out is going to really make everybody negative. Um, you're going to upset people if you say, you'll learn this in a week, and in, you know, three weeks later, they're still trying to. Um, so if you set reasonable time frames, if you make sure that you're overestimating, people will feel like they're surpassing expectations, and you'll also help management by not having unrealistic expectations about when you'll be finished with this. And this is literally the most important thing I learned while I was teaching. Uh, don't be negative. Like, again, I was teaching 13-year-olds, but it, the same thing holds for, you know, 42-year-olds. When you're teaching someone and you're negative about something or you're negative about their learning, they reflect that upon you 10 times. So you need to be positive about the entire thing. When somebody is upset, when somebody is having problems, you need to be helping them, you need to be empathetic, and you can never be negative in front of them. And it's really, really tough. Um, but this is literally one of the most important things to avoid while you're trying to teach somebody else. And you know, teaching and learning are obviously really important to me. 
Um, I'm happy to chat about this more in depth. I'm happy to talk about specific things you can do. I'm happy to hear your situations and context and give you some advice. I've, I did it for a long time. I wrote several curriculum, or curricula, but you know, this is PuppetConf, and I want to talk to you a little bit about Puppet and our process going through our Puppet 3 to 4 upgrade. Um, so it's also important that uh, when you're, you know, that we, we talk about some of the anti-patterns that people had in their old uh, Puppet 3 installs. So um, I'm also gonna talk a little bit at the end about some of the features that we're still being a little bit wary of if we have time. Um, so if you haven't noticed or paid attention during other parts of this talk, um, I've kind of talked a lot about that, the fact that there's this entire ecosystem of Puppet out there. It's not just a tool, it's not just a language. There are a lot of different parts that you're going to need to be thinking about. Um, and some of the biggest gains that we got while addressing our upgrade, we're not talking about Puppet specifically, but talking about our use of Puppet and the use of the ecosystem as a whole. And talking with other people, some of those same pains are what other people are having as well. So first anti-pattern. Uh, it, version control seems to be the place where most admin, sysadmins, where most ops people encounter, or sorry, config management seems to be where most ops people encounter version control for the first time. Uh, most of the people I work with uh, before we introduce a version and get to them, they would just you know, copy off a text file to a timestamp. Um, and that's how a lot of people still do it in the wild. Um, and it's important to note that Git can be overly complex and intimidating, and Subversion can feel old and clunky even when it was new, at least in my opinion. Um, so the first thing that you should do, even if you have a good Git workflow that you love, is talk to your team about version control. Um, develop a strategy. Um, you know, this, you, you need to do this before you start doing this. Um, or b before you start trying to upgrade from Puppet 3 to 4. Again, even if you've got a good one. There are a lot of good workflows out there that you can consider, um, but really, this is up to your team. What you need to do is be discussing how you want to be using Puppet, how you want to be deploying Puppet, how you want to be testing Puppet, and you need to codify those practices that you, and the steps that are going to be there because that is going to be your version control workflow. It's not just about whether or not you want to use Git or Subversion. You need to be talking about whether you want pull requests. You need to be talking about branching. You need to be talking about does, what branch does things, do things get tested in? Are you doing smoke testing, et cetera? Um, if, you are in the case, if you are in a situation where you are trying to figure out what kind of Git workflow that you want to be using, uh, I would go ahead and suggest that you use, or take a look at both GitLab flow and GitHub flow. Um, they're both good methods, but they both talk about a lot of overarching things that you can decide whether you want to add them into your workflow or not. Um, the next anti-pattern that we kind of started solving was that uh, most of us didn't know enough about how to test code or Puppet in general. Um, I tried introducing uh, testing to our Puppet infrastructure like a year and a half ago, um, and the first time that we had somebody try using our spec puppet, I got a spec file back from them that literally had every resource and parameter in a file uh, in, the, in the spec file. So that's not how you need to be <laughs> testing puppet as anybody who's doing that knows. Um, and just using our spec puppet or puppet our spec or puppet lint, or maybe it is our spec puppet and I have that slide wrong, uh, or puppet lint isn't good enough, right? You need to be figuring out your comprehensive testing. Um, whether it is, it, you need to feel com confident in the code that you're shipping and that's going on to your servers and deploying your arch infrastructure. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't matter what level of anything you have, it matters that everybody on your team is comfortable doing it. Um, and so, things that we've talked about a lot in this area is that. When you're, te we've, we've talked specifically about what a unit is. What should you be testing in a manifest? Really, for Puppet, at least in my opinion, you should be testing your logic. Anything that's going to break something in production, anything where if somebody has changed a variable so that uh, you, know, you don't hit an if statement, those are the things you wanna be testing for. You don't need a test that every parameter's in place. 
But you know, if something's gonna break a server, great. Uh, if you haven't taken a look at it, you should also be looking at Beaker RSpec or server spec or in spec because when it comes down to it, the thing that you care most about testing is that your server rolled out correctly or that a change rolled out correctly. And those are far better at doing that because that's the job of those tools. Puppet RSpec, which is where a lot of people start, is really about ensuring that your code is correct, um, which is very different. Um, we weren't using roles and profiles, which I had mentioned earlier. Um, this is a, this was an anti-pattern for us, but really what I wanna say is that the anti-patterns you need to solve for is whether the, uh, whether your structure of your puppet code makes sense to you. Uh, any structure that makes sense is good, but if you read everything about roles and profiles, you'll see that the goal of them was to provide clarity to your puppet uh, code. Uh, you know, previously when people were on 2.6 or so, you'd have this spaghetti mess. And if you can't separate things into, way, into a readable manner for every single person on your team, it, it's, it doesn't mean anything. You know, with roles and profiles, we can take somebody who's never looked at Puppet before and they can say, oh, well, this node has this class. You follow the role. You find in the role that it's including five profiles and you can find what's in each of those. None of them are too long to read, anything like that. And we do keep very on top of that. It, we try to keep our roles and profiles so that they are human readable, not so that we know what's going, so that everybody can know what's going on. Um, not relying on the forge. I mentioned this earlier. This, again, the not invented here syndrome problem is that if you haven't uh, used Puppet solidly in a couple of years, if the last time you were looking at Forge modules was 2013, things are really different now. Like, I remember looking at things and like back in 2012, 2013, and saying that this module is garbage, I don't wanna use it. Um, but, you know, we were trying to demo some of what we were learning, and we literally had an elk stack up in like 30 minutes an hour, which you couldn't do previously. Um, so, you have to make sure that your team is asking, why are we doing something if somebody has already done it? Um, there are going to be a lot of things that you need to spend actual time on for Puppet, so why on earth are you spending time trying to decide how to manage something that somebody else has spent more time than you doing? Um, so you need to rely on the forge, you need to be using the code that people have done, and if you have a problem with a module on the forge, you contribute back to it. Again, we're talking about open source here. So part of your contract for using these open source tools is that you should be committing back to the repositories if you need to extend something. When you don't, you get into the drift that I was talking about earlier where you end up needing to renormalize down the road. Um, so I, I didn't put in a couple more things because I wanted to save time for questions. So. The last anti-pattern that I'm going to talk about today is that I didn't have enough cat pictures in this talk. Um, so I have fixed that for you. Yeah. Um, so I'm happy to take questions on more anti-patterns. I'm happy to ramble for five more minutes if that's what you care while you look at the cat pictures. But uh, if you have questions, let's go. So after a certain point, empathy doesn't work because people dig in their heels. Uh, we recently in our team had a person who didn't want his IKEA pattern 10 line rsync module replaced with the Puppet Forge, Puppet supported upstream. How do you get through to those people and say you have to let go besides playing let it go from Frozen? Uh, well, uh, that, that's a good way to do it, but uh, <laughs> the, when I said that getting managers involved in the relearning process earlier, one of the other things that that helps with is that if your supervisor, if your manager, if their manager are involved with this, if they have bought in to the fact that you need to do this, um, you can have them step in. You know, if you are on the bottom level, it is not your responsibility to make sure that every individual in your organization follows along with things. That's what you have management for, that's what you have team, or like architects and leads for. So if you have that kind of structure, you should rely on it and you should get them involved so that they can help you with those issues. 
Any more questions? All right. I mean, I can ramble, or we can just let you go and have a little bit longer of a break. So. All right. Well, cool. Thank you, Josh.